So today we're going to look at the first king that was appointed for the nation of Israel, and that is King Saul. So if you have your Bibles, our main text is going to be in 1 Samuel. And I want, this is the first time I've ever read this many verses in a message. So I want you to be prepared because it's so important to get the whole context of what's going on. Because I believe that God's going to speak to our hearts today. But we have to know what God's word says in this context. So get ready. Let's, it's going to be 35 verses, okay? But it's good stuff, I promise. It's going to end with a bang, okay? Just get ready. So 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to be reading 1 through 35. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Okay? He's preparing him. Listen. How many of us need to grow in our listening skills? I'm pointing to myself right here. Listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what... Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all. Everybody say all. All. All that they have. Very clear, right? Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Now for the sake of time, I can't give more explanation. I know that people struggle with this verse. Why would a good God annihilate an entire people? I have some scripture references. I'd love to have this continued conversation. We just can't get into it, but I promise you God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And I know that my God is a very thorough God and he makes no mistakes. Everything's intentional, but we can talk about that more if you have questions. It says, so Saul summoned the people and numbered them into Lem, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites, and Saul defeated the Amalekites from Hivalah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good. Okay, saving all that's good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. How very convenient, Saul. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told, um, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Okay, so he's not only in layered disobedience to God's word. He's so blinded by his sin that he's erecting a, a monument for himself. He's proud of himself. That's, that's when you know you're so blinded to sin because you do the absolute ridiculous foolishness. And I'm, I'm saying that's why I need Jesus too. I need Jesus it says, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared. Huh. He conveniently let, left himself out. The people, you know when you're in sin, when you start pointing fingers. You know when you're in sin, when you start making excuses. And listen, excuses is a fruit of a victim mentality. Keeps us stuck. Says, well, if they didn't, if they did, then I wouldn't. It says, the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, 
Notice, Saul says, your God, not my God. And he says, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Remember last week, we, the people said no to God? Well, this time the prophet says stop to the king. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. So he's saying, I'm not even going to address the people. You're the one God anointed. You're the leader. You're the one that has to take responsibility. That's when you can notice a true leader because they take 100% responsibility. Verse 18, and it says, and the Lord sent you. He didn't send those other people. He sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, and the best of things devoted to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people. There it is. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that she, he should have regret. Then he said, I've sinned, yet honor me, before, honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel. Do you see his focus here? And he says, and return with me that I may bow before the Lord your God. So Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul bowed down before the Lord. Then Samuel said, bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag, Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag to pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death. But Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. I've entitled today's message, The Rejected King. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. Let your truth convict our hearts. Expose things in us that are not pleasing to the Lord. And if there's any ways in our life that we do not have complete obedience, would you show us and will you give us the power and the courage to obey the voice of the Lord and not obey the voice of man? God, we love you. We give you all the glory and praise because you are in this place. We worship you and we thank you for this time in your word. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Uh, my family and I, we watch movies together and we are a subtitle movie watching family. Is there anybody else that likes the subtitles on when you watch, you know, because you can't always trust what you hear. And sometimes you think you hear what you're hearing, but then you see the subtitle and you're like, oh, 
I would have missed a whole big part of that movie if it weren't for the subtitles. And so I realized that in this passage, we see that Saul has selective hearing. And if we're honest, we have selective hearing from God. And in, in this situation, God was very clear, concise, precise, thorough. He chose a servant that would deliver the word of the Lord who obeyed him completely. So there was no room for misinterpretation of what the word of the Lord was for Saul. And so we need God's word and the Holy Spirit to turn on subtitles for our life. Because there are times where we think we're hearing from the Lord. And that's why it's so imp important that we're careful about what we're listening to and who we're listening to. Because Saul was, he was struggling with more than just the listening problem. There were other layers of struggle here. And I want to submit to you that we should approach this text with the humility to say, God help me if I'm like Saul. Because the temptation is, is we want to approach this text and say, I'm like Samuel. But that's, I, I feel like it's better to be on the humbler side. Let God teach us, correct us, rebuke us, and train us up into the ways of Samuel and Jesus than it is to come assuming I'm already at a good place. Because that will lead to spiritual pride, and we will make bad decisions, and we won't be able to really hear the voice of the Lord. That's why we need Jesus, is because we all have a sinful nature. We were born because of the sin of Adam. We all were born into the sinful nature, and we needed a spotless Savior to cover us and to cleanse us from our sin. So the first thing that I noticed with Saul is Saul partnered with the people in sin instead of obeying the word of the Lord. So that, that's the problem right here, is he was chosen to lead the people, not partner with the people and be swayed with the people, but he led them in sin instead of doing the assignment that God called him to do. And so that's my challenge for us today. Be careful who we partner with. Who we partner with, it can deepen our relationship with Jesus or it can dampen it. And so our inner circle should be very, very strict because I, I've heard Jim Rohn say it. He said that we are the average of the top five people that we spend the most time with. So I think it would be fitting if we took some time to step back and evaluate who has the most access to me most of the time. And is this something that's going to lead me towards Jesus or away from Jesus? We've got to be careful who we follow. In this digital age, there are many, many self-appointed people speaking on behalf of God. And so it's not enough to just hear their message because sometimes they'll say things that stir our emotions or hype us up to a place that, oh, that feels good to me. So I'm going to subscribe to that theology. It's so important that we look at fruit. Because anybody can learn how to speak. Anybody can learn a skill that can stir emotions and gain a following. But you can't fake fruit. You can't. When you're putting hot water, whatever's inside, it's going to come out. Have you, have you ever stubbed your toe? Jesus continue to wash us clean because that's going to help us understand who I should follow, who I should not follow. Young people, your friends are everything. I'm so thankful for our youth group because we have some special students. I'm just so thankful. Pastor Antoine and Andrea, man, and their leadership team, they're making a difference because you guys are amazing. Amazing, amazing. But your friends are so, so important because they will help steer your life. And we want to be very, very intentional about wh which direction we are being steered. And so I want to ask this question, because I was really thinking about this. What causes us to partner with man over God? What would cause someone to d decide when you know God exists and you know that he's in control and you know that he has the best in mind more than I could ever try to imagine for myself, so what, what would cause 
us to partner with man over God. And I had a few things. It's not an exhaustive list, but the three top things that I thought of was pride, fear of man, and our own evil desires. James 1 says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so we've got to recognize there's a lot at play here, and it's so easy to say the devil made me do it, but that is such an incorrect statement. He can't make you do anything. Sometimes he just speaks to the thing that we secretly desire. And that's why we've got to stay in the presence of God and stay in the word of God so that the fear of God rules our minds and our lives so that we can make decisions that please the Lord And that we will not be evil in the sight of the Lord. So we see that Saul partnered with the people in sin and did not obey the word of the Lord. Samuel obeyed the word of the Lord to completion. This is so significant because we need to learn how to listen to the voice of God. This is the voice of God. Listen to it. Receive it by faith. And then do what the word says to completion. Here's the thing. The significance of utterly destroying the Amalekites goes back 400 years. And so the Amalekites, when the Israelites were led out of slavery, the Amalekites were the first to attack Israel. And God took that personally. Because they weren't attacking his, they were attacking his people, but it was, it was in a symbolism of rejection towards God as well. So look at Exodus chapter 17. It says, Then Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek while Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, while Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, here here it is, prophesied 400 years before, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. This was a promise that God was making. And he says, recite it. Why? Because sometimes we forget what the word of the Lord was. Because he takes, God takes time. His timeline is not ours. 400 years later. And it says, and Moses built an altar and called the name of it, the Lord is my banner. Saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And so through that attack, God was waiting. He was waiting for the perfect timing and for the just judgment against the Amalekites. You see, time does not erase sin before God. It just doesn't. You can't say, oh, I did it 20 years ago. We'll still have to stand before a holy God for what we did 20 years ago. And that's why we need Jesus. Because if we stand before God and we're, we're going to be held accountable for every sin, known and unknown. But if we have the blood of Jesus washing us, then we will have mercy and grace and saved in that day. And the most precious thing that we can value is our names being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. No career, no respect, no reputation, nothing. Nothing. No miracles being performed. Nothing touches knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's why we need Jesus. And so before God, the Amalekites were still guilty 400 years later. 
And God was, this was like a twofold thing. I'm sure there's multiple folds in this because God is that, that intricate. But it was a twofold thing. It was going to bring ju judgment to the Amalekites for their attack against Israel. But it was also going to give Saul and the Israelites an opportunity to obey the word of the Lord. And God chose intentionally to use the Israelites to inflict judgment upon the Amalekites by saying, wipe them out completely, um, destroy them utterly. And they missed that opportunity to be used of the Lord to do his will. They failed it. They failed it. I love this quote by Alexander McLaren. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. Saul and his men obeyed as far as suited them. That is to say they did not obey God at all, but their own inclinations both in sparing the good and destroying the worthless. What was not worth carrying off was destroyed, not because of command, but to save trouble. And so they were doing what felt right to them instead of having the fear of the Lord to do exactly what he wanted them to do. What's so interesting and significant is that Saul started off humble but ended up prideful. And I think that this is a good warning, sobering message for all of us to understand how fall, far we can fall. We can start in humble places, but things like power and position and, and success can puff us up to a place where we're no longer sensitive to the voice of God. So I ask myself this question, how does one start humble and end up prideful? And so this is, this is how Saul started off. He was, he was just tending to do his father's business. They lost, uh, they lost um, some donkeys. And so he's just out there looking for donkeys. And then the Lord, the Lord spoke to Samuel to say, this is the one you're going to anoint. And in 1 Samuel 9, Samuel says to Saul, he says, As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for your father's house? And so Samuel's speaking favorably upon Saul. And Saul answered, am I not a Benjamin, Benjaminite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribes of, tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? He was confused. He's like, I'm the least. My tribe is the least. I'm the least of the tribe. Why would you speak? He's speaking to me. So Saul started off very humble. And then as he got that position, he began to turn away from the Lord. And so I, I, I recognize that pride is very sneaky. And we don't always recognize when it is weaved its way into our lives and in our hearts. But the word, it gives us standards to know whether we were walking in pride or humility so that we're not deceived. Look at Galatians 6. It says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work. And then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. And so God is, is, is giving us very clear instruction that we have our own work to do, and that I should be spending my time testing it. If we would all just do this. Not. Oh, they're far ahead. Oh, 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 oh. I can't run a race like that. I can't do any productive work like that. I'm dealing with envy and comparison and all of these different things that take me out of my assignment. And every single day, we need to say, what, what's my assignment today, Lord? Okay, all right. I'm going to give my all. I'm not going to look to the left, and I'm not going to look to the right. I'm going to give my all. And then the, the word of God says, at the end of the day, you can be like, yes, I did what God told me to do today. I finished my assignment today. I didn't get distracted by all this stuff happening around me. I stayed focused on my work. I didn't get discouraged by the hardship of life. I stayed focused on my work alone. And when we test our own work, it'll develop humility in our lives. But if we compare our work to other people's work, it's going to lead to pride. 
And we've got to keep watch over ourselves because we all have plenty to do for the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. We need to continually let the Holy Spirit test our ambition and motives. Because, listen, I don't always know when I have wrong motives, but the Holy Spirit does. And if we just stay sensitive to him, he will show us. And look at what Philippians 2 says. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so we need to take the ambition that we have and test it before the Lord and ask him because he wants to tell us because sometimes we just do stuff in life because it seems like a good thing to do. But I'm learning how to slow down more the older I get to make sure that I'm clear on God's assignments in my life and that I'm not doing things because just because someone asked me to and I'm not doing them just because they're good to do. I'm really trying to let the Lord speak to me so that I do what I'm supposed to be doing. Because, you know, I, I realized this past week the Holy Spirit showed me something. There was something I was going to do because I thought it was a good thing to do. And then I didn't do it. And I was having some, like, regret not doing the good thing. And the Holy Spirit, he does not play. And he goes, you didn't want to do that good thing because you really wanted to do that good thing. You just wanted to look good. Humble pie. But it's honest and real, and it's what my heart needs. I need the truth of the Lord in my life. I heard this quote, we'd be a lot healthier if we were about being successful, not looking successful. And so we need, we need God's word to be bold to us so that we can continue to walk in humility. And I think part of it is asking the question, why do I want to do this thing? Is it really an assignment for the Lord? Or is it because I want to appear good? And God will tell us. You see, Saul, and I'm about to close, Saul was wrapped up in himself, his position, and the favor of the people. Even to the end, when Samuel told him, you have sinned, you have not obeyed, you have disobeyed. Even to the end, he was not overly concerned about where he was with the Lord. I mean, he confessed it, but he was still like, hey, I need you to do this thing so that I can still have favor in the eyes of the people. Listen, we've got, to, we've got to wrestle with that whole thing, saying, God, who cares if everyone thinks I'm great if you see sin in my life? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> and so I want to close with 1 Corinthians. It says, now concerning food offered to idols, because this was, this was just an issue in the church of Corinth that they were dealing with. That, that, that was what he was, he used this illustration of one of the things that we, they were dealing with. But he says, this truth, and this is what I want us to focus on, this truth right here. All of us possess knowledge. This knowledge, notice it's in quotations, this knowledge puffs up. But love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he's known by God. And this is really significant for us to grasp because we look at knowledge and we think we want more knowledge. And that's, that's not a bad thing. The Bible says that we should pursue knowledge. We should pursue wisdom. Though it costs all we have, go get it. So there is, there is something wise about pursuing knowledge. However, he's making this understanding that when we get more and more and more and more knowledge, it puffs us up. It doesn't do what love can only do. It makes me think of a balloon, which can be destroyed with a tiny little pin. But love, notice the words that God has chosen to teach us. Love builds. It is something sturdy. It is something useful. And it is what drove God. I mean, obviously, he is a just God, but he also loved us, and that's why he gave us his son to die for us because he didn't want us to remain in our sinful state. 
Listen, we can have a relationship with Jesus based on the solid foundation of love rather than knowing God based on information I've obtained about him. Do you see the distinction there? That's why there's some people that know God, but they don't know God. It's more accurately, they know about God. That's why Saul kept saying, your God, your God, your God, because he hadn't really let God be his God. David would always say, my God, my Lord. And that's what Jesus wants with all of us. He wants all of us to have a personal relationship. That's why it's not about religion. And I grew up in a religious denomination. And it was about ritual, and it was about routine, and it was about repetitiveness. And when I got saved in a tiny Baptist like trailer and the gospel was preached, I recognized the difference between religion and a relationship. And you can have that today, too. You can invite the one who is love. Jesus is love. You can invite him, him into your life right now. And he will show you how to follow him. That's why we t say take next steps because you don't have to run a marathon. You just have to take one step. And your first step might have been coming to church. It might have been watching online. Your first step now or your next step now might be giving your life over to Jesus. And so I want us to have an opportunity to pray. So if you'd bow your hearts and heads before the Lord. And I just want to give that opportunity just for a moment, if there's someone in here that's saying, Bianca, I have sin in my life and I want to have a relationship with Jesus. I want to receive the payment for my sin. If that's you, I just want you to do something brave. Just slip up your hand on the count of three and we're going to pray together. One, two, three. Amen. Yes. I see your hand. You can slip them up and slip them back down. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Yes, I see your hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, let's pray. Church, can we just encourage those that are making this decision for the first time, or maybe it's been a while and they know that they're coming back to the Lord today. I want all of us to pray this boldly. Say, dear Jesus, I confess my sin to you. Wash me and make me new. I believe that you are the son of God. Help me follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, church. Let's just celebrate. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.